Hello, everyone. My name is Layla Durstein. Uh, I have the pleasure of heading up lifelong learning and intellectual engagement for alumni here at Williams College. We are so delighted to be here with you today for this program. This is one of a year long series of events uh, that we are hosting and organizing commemorating the 200th anniversary of the founding of the Williams College Society of Alumni. As many of you know, uh, our society is the oldest alumni association here in North America and quite possibly the world. Um, and we are united in our shared commitment to a liberal arts education, to lifelong learning, and most especially to one another and to this college. As we begin today's program, um, I do want to acknowledge a legacy of displacement of Indigenous Mohican people from the lands upon which Williams College is built and resides. Uh, Williams College resides on the ancestral and spiritual lands of the Mohican people, and each of us comes to today's virtual space from all over the country on the traditional land of Indigenous peoples. We pay respect to our Indigenous elders past and present by acknowledging this deeply troubled history. Thank you. A few reminders before we get started. If you have any questions during today's talk, please do use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen and toolbar at any time. We'll have dedicated time for Q&A toward the end of the program, but you can submit your questions as you think of them. Uh, please reserve the chat as a space to engage with the community and share any reflections, comments, um, or thoughts you may have. And I see many of you doing that, introducing yourselves, so thank you. Please remember to select everyone in the chat dropdown so that your message can be seen uh, by all. And a final note that we are indeed recording today's session. So with that, I uh, have the privilege of introducing our featured speakers. Uh, we're so happy to have them here. So Meg Lauman, class of 1976, she serves as director of the Tree Foundation and as a National Geographic Explorer. Um, she's been called the real life Lorax by National Geographic. The Wall Street Journal has called her the Einstein of the treetops. Meg is an author, explorer, scientist, Arbor Knot, and we'll meet, we'll learn what that means if you haven't picked up her latest book, but spoiler alert, it's a treetop explorer. Uh, and Meg is a change agent for conservation. She's devoted over three decades to exploration and research on uh, the secrets uh, that are found in the treetops and uh, is really one of the first pioneers to launch canopy science um, in the ways that she has. She's published 10 books. Uh, and over 150 peer-reviewed publications. And her most recent projects include um, creating a UNESCO World Heritage Forest Site in Malaysia and partnering with um, Ethiopia's Coptic priests to save the, the last 5% of their church forests. So thank you so much, Meg. Uh, we're delighted to have you. I also want to introduce Meg's conversation partner today. Uh, many of you know Tom uh, from your days here at, at Williams. So Tom served as assistant administrator for water programs at the EPA um, and subsequently as the commissioner of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. He was also a professor and director of the Center for Environmental Studies here at Williams College. Um, he served as vice president for environmental affairs uh, for the International Paper Company and chief executive office of NEON, an NSF funded ecological observatory program. While at Williams College, Tom taught courses in land use law and policy, environmental law and policy, energy law and policy, and legislative process. And he um, has served and continues to serve on a number of boards, um, including the Wild Center Hoosick uh, River Revival in Williamstown Rural Lands Foundation. We are so pleased to have you both with us today and in conversation. Uh, with that, I will turn things over to Meg and Tom. Thank you, Lila. And uh, it is a distinct pleasure to, uh, to welcome back, at least virtually, Meg to the Purple Valley. And uh, I, uh, I suspect that uh, we'll all learn a great deal about what Meg has been up to in the many years since since graduation. Uh, I'm also 
pleased to serve in this capacity uh, to recognize and uh, share uh, information coming from Meg's most recent book, uh, which I'm going to hold up here. It's uh, I don't know whether it shows up very well, but in any event, it's entitled The Arbornaut, A Life Discovering the Eighth Continent in the Trees Above Us. Uh, and we will try and uh, get Meg to expound upon some of the themes in, in the book. Uh, I found it uh, very interesting and, and very informative. Uh, and what we hope to do uh, is basically range back and forth from sort of biographical uh, kinds of uh, discussions uh, through to science and exploration. And I think it would be appropriate to, we'll try and extract out of Meg uh, uh, the, both the joys and challenges of writing and communication uh, with nine books under her belt and a uh, frequent guest lecture or lecture around the world, uh, those topics I think are, are worthy of, of, some, of some discussion. As serendipity would have it, uh, both Meg and I arrived on campus in the fall of 1972. Meg uh, becoming uh, a student and learning what it was to be a student. And I was trying to learn how to be a professor uh, I had not any background in uh, academia prior to uh, entering the faculty in, in 1972. So we both, in effect, uh, spent uh, time together uh, learning about Williams and Williams's opportunities. And uh, I think uh, we both uh, benefited greatly from, from that experience. So as I said, we'll, we'll range back and forth across uh, uh, themes. And I'd, what I'd like to do is start with some sort of biographical uh, discussion from, from Meg. And it, it's a, this is a question that I used to ask in every class that I, or every course that I taught at, at Williams. And that was some version of what is it uh, and what was it? that attracted your interest uh, in the environment sufficient to enroll in courses uh, and perhaps even majors that are related to that? Uh, was it uh, uh, events or was it family uh, activities? Uh, what is it that uh, you can point to if you go back into your youth and say, these are the things that uh, caused me to pursue the direction that I have and not only pursued it, uh, but pursued it uh, in, in very wonderful ways. So Meg, can you point to some, some things that uh, caused you to, uh, to have that interest in environment? Sure, what a great question, Tom. Hey, but first I wanna give a shout out back to you as my influential professor and the first head of environmental studies. I watch the list here in the chat room of all sorts of students that I know benefited from your mentoring and inspiration. Everyone from my classmates, high class of 76, to some of the students that went on the canopy walkway with me. So I just want to thank you. I'm really honored that you're my conversation partner today because you've done so much. And in my adult years, you were certainly a reason for inspiration about the environments. Um, but in my childhood, um, I guess that was a little bit why I wrote the book. I thought I was about the most ordinary kid on the planet, not growing up near the Smithsonian or ever knowing a woman scientist. So sometimes I do scratch my head, you know, why did I become a scientist? But I did love nature. I was pretty shy and I grew up in a rural part of New York. So I think as I look back, one of my take home messages whenever I talk to schools or parents or even corporate people is, you know, we need to take kids out into nature. I got pretty excited to see a bird nest or go into the forest and watch the leaves change color and all those things, even though they were pretty small events, perhaps in the life of most people were a big deal to me. So I think I started loving the environment when I was about age three. 
And somehow it never, ever left me. And I do think taking kids out into nature continues to be a really important way. I hope that we can keep the environment uh, up and up front and center for people because it needs our attention now more than ever. I'll turn around, Tom, and ask you, how did you get interested in the environment? Well, it's, uh, it's a long time ago, so I have trouble even <laughs> recollecting some of the aspects of my childhood. But I think, uh, and, and this was a, an answer that many of the students gave when I would ask that question in courses, and that was uh, family trips to the Western parks. Uh, I think that's where uh, it had its it had its roots. Uh, and then uh, I think the second thing was uh, the inspiration of several people that I sort of interacted with when I was younger that did have a, a strong bent towards towards environment. Uh, uh, there was a woods behind our house uh, and among other features, the uh, person who lived above the woods and actually owned the woods was the last uh, living uh, veteran of the Civil War. And uh -huh. he was out chopping wood all the time and I would go out and I would stack the wood that he would be oh splitting and chopping. So uh, it was, uh, it, it's hard to pinpoint specific things, but it was something that I did, perhaps like you, I, I tried to nurture plants in the basement uh, and try and figure out why they grew and what influence they're growing. So it was a, a combination of things, uh, but it was one that, uh, that certainly had uh, uh, a strong hold on, on me uh, when I was going to college. Uh, I was considering going to forestry school. Um, and so uh, uh, that got diverted bec because of uh, other matters. But uh, it, it so it's a deep, it was deeply uh, embedded somewhere along the line. And, and uh, it continued through most of my, my professional career. Now, Meg, you you exhibited your adventuresome spirit in ways that you perhaps didn't realize, or maybe it's uh, that you did realize it, but you were in uh, among the first uh, women admitted to Williams College, an all-male bastion uh, in 1972 when you came on campus. Did you realize that you were occupying that sort of path-breaking uh, pattern uh, at the time you were enrolling in, in Williams? Not really. Of course, I was pretty naive. And I have to laugh because my high school guidance counselor, when I said I wanted to apply to this college called Williams because it had a forest, I looked that up in the guidebook. He said, oh, no, there's no such college. You must mean William and Mary. So that was kind of the level of information from my high school. But I persisted and applied to this college and didn't really appreciate that piece of everything. But, you know, at the time, even then, it seemed OK. I, I do remember not finding too many ladies rooms over in the science quad and probably a couple other things. We used to laugh and sage about all the guys going to, uh, you know, Smith and Mount Holyoke on the weekends. but. Otherwise, I guess we just took it in stride because it was too new maybe to appreciate that it was something different. And I don't know how you felt as a faculty. Did they kind of have to coach all of you in trying to do things differently? Because you were new anyway, so maybe that didn't matter for you. Yeah, I uh, actually, I don't think I even realized that that, uh, that transition was underway uh, when, I, when I joined the faculty. Uh, and I guess I, I would say in retrospect, I just simply assumed that that's the way it was, that, yeah. uh, that, this, uh, that the student body uh, comprised of both women and men was, was ordinary. Uh, to me, it wasn't a big change, although almost all of my ac academic background uh, was at all male institutions, high school and college. And it wasn't until I went to graduate school that uh, that I was at an institution that uh, that was co-ed. Uh, but that it is interesting. And I will say, too, you know, in, in the book, I tried to write a little about that. And I, I laughed because 
Uh, my editor, you asked me, you know, you said, we'll talk about writing. She kept pushing me from Farrell Strauss and Giroux. Why? Tell the story. Give us the details. And, you know, I think about going to that geology field camp as the only girl. And how did it feel? And I had to really wreck my brain because I'm old enough now that some of those things were in the interstices of my mind. But, you know, it was kind of fun to have an editor that said, you need to think about the story. How did it feel? Was it uncomfortable? Was it okay? And all my crazy doings in Hopkins Forest, you know, riding my bike up there and grabbing all the leaves become part of that sort of embarrassing chapter about being such a young and naive college student. But on the other hand, those are the formative stories that I guess make your career in the end. Did In refl reflecting on it, would you consider your experience at Williams as enhancing your interest in environment and facilitating it or did it raise barriers? What Absolutely. I think the one surprise to me was how many students were pre-med and how few were ecological at the time. And I think you brought in a mix of environmental studies students through activities at CES that included you know, political science majors and American civ majors and even language majors, whereas back in biology, there was quite a majority of pre-med. So that was in itself a little daunting. And that was about the only thing. But luckily, they did have that fantastic forest. And remember, we had a lot of unusual assets. We had Jerry Jenkins and we had, you know, the whole of Vermont to explore and we had pine cobble to hike up. And so I think going to a rural college for me was fabulous, even though maybe for some students, you would be trying to migrate to the cities to perhaps find fulfillment in whatever interested you. But all I had to do is pretty much go outside and there are a lot of funny stories from my classmates, you know, finding me in my room with all these leaves and branches on the floor of Mission Park. So I might have not been the normal student either. <laughs> well, it's, well, it's interesting. Uh, you mentioned that about pre-med students, even though our undergraduate years were separated by 40 years at, at a university a little bit larger than Williams, we had about, I guess, 4,800 students at, at Notre Dame. I was, uh, uh, another fellow and I were the only two biology majors among all of the people in biology. All the rest were pre-med. Yeah, so wow. It, it, it's a characteristic. I hope that pattern uh, is changing. But so let's now pursue uh, uh, sort of the next steps. Uh, you, you're graduating from Williams, and you're deciding that, yes, uh, pursuing a PhD is something that you were inclined to do. Uh, take us through some of the process, uh, your own mental uh, uh, deliberations and, and uh, discussions with your folks. Uh, what took you then to the next step? It, I know it was to go to Duke, uh, but go from Duke uh, beyond to Aberdeen, Scotland, and then sure. Sydney, Australia. Uh, sort of give us a, a sense of how you deliberated on those choices and on those moves, because as they do also reflect uh, a, a certain spirit of, of adventuresome. Uh, so right. take us through a little bit of that. I was not a member of the Explorers Club at the time, even though I am now, of course. You know, it is funny, and I think that's where perhaps the woman in science thing became stronger when I looked around the world and uh, thought to myself, in all fairness, oh my gosh, I better get a PhD now because otherwise I'll get married and I'll never ever go back to school again. I'll be a mom and I might get distracted from my passion for nature. And yet I didn't have a role model. I think about that a lot. And that's influenced my own career to try really hard to always answer emails from girls and boys um, in science because we need you know, male students to be sensitive to women as well as we need bold and brave women scientists. But I think to myself, I probably would have benefited from someone to talk to who was a female role model at the time, which literally didn't exist in the Williams faculty and didn't actually exist at the Duke faculty either. So I had a couple hurdles, as you 
probably read, I had this incredible experience escaping an assailant on, at the Duke campus and just kind of feeling a little bit disenfranchised in the forestry school at Duke, despite the fact I had a scholarship and was very grateful to that. So it caused me to pause. It caused me a lot to feel that I wasn't worthy. I think that was one of the bigger issues um, that frequented my pathway. And maybe that's the product of being at a public school and then kind of going through life maybe in some sort of more passive pathway in the beginning. But I did take this really wild decision to go to Aberdeen and do a master's as a kind of leave from Duke to think about all this. And lo and behold, Aberdeen was so equitable. That was an amazing experience to have an international class of master students, half female and half male, which might have been part of the British system at the time, but it really did reinforce to me that it was okay to pursue what I was doing. So that was a good thing. And along the track there, I got, you know, sidelined to passionate passion about the tropics because my advisor, a pretty famous tropical botanist named Peter Ashton, who ended up coming to Harvard, by the way, to become the head of the herbarium there. Um, he uh, was in Scotland and he was my advisor there and just said, you're nobody in science if you don't work in the tropics because that's where all the issues are. And I'd hardly ever really heard of a tropical rainforest. So that I guess was a very, you know, seminal point in my career to make this crazy decision to buy a $200 ticket on People's Airline to accept this scholarship at Sydney University. My mom cried on the public phone, as you can imagine. There were no cell phones and there was no internet. So I called her from a pay phone and said, I bought a ticket to Australia. And she's like, what? You know, because it turned out I didn't actually see my parents for years and years at that point in time. But it, it was part of my passion. You're absolutely right. I just probably didn't quite recognize that at the time. So you finish or you pursue and complete your, your PhD uh, in Australia. Uh, and it is the place, I guess, where the tropics uh, deeply affected your, your future. And uh, you might talk a little bit about, not as you do in the book, uh, very forthrightly, uh, talk about your uh, uh, you know, falling in love uh, there and and experiencing the culture there, uh, but you did complete the degree, and so take us through sort of Australia uh, as sure. a chapter. And again, when I got to Sydney University, I was one of two women in biological sciences out of some twenty five or thirty graduate students. And she ended up eloping with one of the other faculty. So then I was the only one. So it was still kind of in my head, oh my gosh, I'll probably fail. I probably can't succeed, but at least I will have seen a koala. That was kind of my philosophy that I would have this amazing experience. Uh, and I didn't appreciate that Australia is kind of got a chauvinistic culture, especially in the heartland, which I sure found out later. Um, you are right. I kind of, you know, gave quite a honest um, story in my book. And I'll be, I'll tell you that when I wrote that book, Life in the Treetops in 1999, another kind of memoir about the beginning of the world of canopy science, I was way too scared. I never would have dared write about all my trials and tribulations because I figured I would lose my job or something. But now that I'm old and almost gray, I figured it's good for women to know what women need to know to be smarter. And in Australia, I had to really get my street smarts. I did a lot of driving by myself. I did a lot of camping by myself. I was in a man's world pretty much at the university. And lo and behold, my advisor said, oh, you want to study, you know, leaves and the trees of the rainforest? Well, guess what? They're 200 feet high. You will have to get to the top of those trees. And I'm like, holy cow, I never thought about that problem. I thought I could have a hammock and lie at the bottom and let the leaves fall down. But he said, no, you really need to figure out how to get up there. And I give him a lot of credit for launching my career in that sense. I'm sitting here actually with my favorite little slingshot, which you probably can't see it with my green screen. But anyway, you know, making that first slingshot, which this is not, this is a purchased one from a hunting catalog. Um, 
allowed me to get these lines and ropes up the tree for the first time and gave me this insight to a world that almost nobody had ever seen. And lo and behold, you know, millions of things are living up there. And when you think about it, Tom, it's what I call hit you over the head science. All the flowers and the fruits are at the top of the tree where the light is. So it would only make sense that all the millions of bugs and beetles and birds and animals would be up there too. So this extraordinary world was opened up to me. And that's the word arbor knot. Of course, the title of the book uh, is Layla hinted, you know, astronauts got their start in the 1960s when we went to the moon. Aquanauts got their start in the 1950s when we first developed scuba gear, but arbor nuts didn't get their start until the 1980s when a couple of us made these slingshots and started building canopy walkways and a few other crazy tools to climb trees. We'll talk about that a little bit because in addition to science, you exhibited, uh, as you describe it in the book, a, a certain skill with engineering, not only the slingshot, but the apparatus that you would use to hoist yourself uh, into the trees. And uh, you, you had to solve some problems that uh, were associated with basically accessing uh, a part of the ecosystem which had not been really accessed before. So describe how you sort of confronted that and also uh, just the whole idea of, of uh, sort of kicking around in the canopy of, of trees, which is not uh, uh, what you might call a safe, a safe occupation. So how did you, how did you uh, confront those problems and then try to solve them? I confronted those problems with a lot of fear and anxiety. <laughs> I'll be very honest. I was not one of these brave people that did rock climbing in high school or, you know, was a mountaineering person in my youth, although I guess I was still kind of youthful, but I was so curious and I was so driven by this really basic question about why in the heck are the leaves changing color and falling off the trees and back in upstate New York in Hopkins Forest as well. And yet in the tropics, they're evergreen and they're green all year round. So I just found that very curious and that overcame some of my fears and anxieties. And I have to say, I ate a heck of a lot of Oreo cookies that always calmed me down when I was up in the treetops. It sort of became a, a movement. I'm still waiting to see if, you know, Nabisco will fund some of this rainforest work because they need to. Um, but it was at the time pretty crazy. You're right. And yet the methods he had an element of safety. I learned a lot from the caving club at Sydney who had developed safe ways to go down a rope. And I was interested in doing the opposite thing to go up a rope. Um, and then eventually when I had Earthwatch grants and volunteers climbing trees with me to help count bugs in the leaves and all sorts of other curiosities, uh, we started that first forest canopy walkway up in Queensland in 1985. So, the method of the rope is very solo oriented, one person on one rope or else it would break. Um, so the business of getting 10 people in the canopy was challenge number two, and that was um, resulted in the canopy walkway that eventually led to building the walkway at Williams College, which was great fun. Yeah, actually the walkway you talk about in Queensland, Sandy and I both uh, walked that walk. Oh, great. That's so great. Well, come but down and walk on Florida, too. <laughs> there is a lot of engineering uh, associated with those walks, but there's also a lot of uh, appreciation for the strengths and weaknesses of, of trees. Uh, yeah. How did you, did you get consultants to help you with, with, with trying to navigate that, that problem? I guess I was lucky that I was not too heavy that I, I was able to dangle delicately on my ropes or something. I had some crazy rules of thumb, like never climbing a branch that was less than the diameter of my thigh, thinking it was a solid tree. But I did, of course, do as much research as I could. Not a lot of information existed for Australian rainforest trees. There were only one or two other people that had ever even studied them. And I was the first graduate student to work on rainforests at Sydney University. So it was a bit of a school of hard knocks. I certainly could figure out which trees had softwood, like the giant stinging tree, similar to looking at white pine versus oak in the New England 
forests, you kind of start to understand if they're pecked by birds and the you know sawdust is falling out, you might not want to climb that tree. <laughs> but there were too many data points to help me on the safety side, I, I will admit in retrospect. To finish your degree, uh, obviously it took uh, a lot of a lot of work. But what about your thesis advisor? Uh, were they encouraging, or uh, were they cynical, or what? How did they? How did you sort of navigate the uh, the issues associated with moving into an area which required a lot of innovation? Uh, it was something that there were no books written upon it. Uh, were they suspicious of your interest in the canopy or were they encouraging of that? I, I think I was pretty lucky. I had a very mild mannered, gentlemanly advisor from Cambridge, an English botanist who had come out to Australia. And I think even he was overwhelmed by the kind of bawdry environment. He was very much a gentleman and just you know, gently would answer my questions. And he had no idea about climbing trees and no thought about the danger. He just said, Meg, I think you can figure this out. I begged him that I could try to train a monkey or do something. You know, EJ Corner, the famous botanist from Malaysia, trained four monkeys to collect all of his fruits and flowers for his research. I thought that would be such a great fun thing to do. But my advisor just quietly said, I think you can figure this out, but never um, cynical, just sort of very gentle and calm and hoping the best for me from a distance. He never even climbed one of the trees, um, but he was still, I think, a good mentor at the time. So nobody had to question your sampling methods or uh, no, your data well, collection? You know, in that case, yes, because I was very lucky to be surrounded by a lot of coral reef students and that was the big deal at Sydney University. 21 of those 25 say grad students were coral reef enthusiasts and they had a pretty amazing group with a guy named Peter Sale and then a intertidal biologist named Tony Underwood who wrote just about all of the statistical books at the time and analyses and he was sharp as a tack and the lucky thing is he taught statistics every semester. He walked every one of us through our field designs of methods. And I don't think I ever could have succeeded without that type of person who had a much stronger influence in the end on how I designed my experiments. Why replicate leaves? Why have four heights in the tree? Why have three trees at the site? Why have three sites? You know, all of that kind of stuff that scientists need in order to publish their data was something that I hadn't really experienced in the past. So I'm very grateful uh, to that training. And um, the fact that other students were excited, they didn't work in the rainforest, but a lot of the guys especially wanted to come out and use my slingshot. So we traded a lot of field trips. I was a popular choice, you know, go with Megan, use her slingshot for a week. And then in exchange, I would get to go to the reef and count fish for a week. So it was kind of a wonderful world. And maybe I sort of have an honorary degree in coral reef fish as well. <laughs> Let me just pursue this one little step further before I move on to a, other subjects that I would like to get to. Uh, I understand the slingshot, but what would you use to carry the line uh, up over a limb? And what kind of heights are we talking about for accuracy yeah. uh, to get whatever it was you shot with your sling uh, over that limb and have it come back down so you could then hoist the ropes. Tell, tell me a little bit about Listen, that. Tom, I think there's a future for you in tree climbing. I can feel it. <laughs> um, so to, the slingshot would send a line, a fish line, a very lightweight line. In this case, I had used a fish sinker, the same kind of thing that I would buy at a marine hardware store, a round sinker, and I would affix it to my fish line, and then I would shoot the line over a branch. It could easily get 75 to 100 feet high with a good aim and some practice. And then I would take what I called the nylon blind cord. It really was those cords that you used to make put in your curtains um, that you can go and buy a big roll of nylon blind cord, and that's a middle-sized rope. And then I would affix that to the fish line and put that over the branch. And that was strong enough to pull the climbing rope. So it was a three-prong process 
to get the climbing rope in place over the branch, but it, you could never use the fish, uh, the slingshot to put the climbing rope up in the tree. Obviously it was way too heavy uh, as a rope to do that. So that was just kind of my own process of deduction. How could we work this out? I know later there was one guy in Costa Rica who started climbing trees at the same time I did in Australia, but we never met each other for years. And he actually used a crossbow and he put similarly a fish line up first and then a climbing rope to do uh, some work at the uh, La Salva Biological Station in Costa Rica. Meg, let me turn to another uh, piece of, of the book. It's a very candid description and, and you may not want to cover it in real detail here, but there was what I would consider having read the book, a mentor. And it was a surprising one to me, and that was Jill Kerr Conway and the uh, assistance, I guess I will call it, that she gave you at a really difficult time in your life. Absolutely. And absolutely amazing. You know, I just am so grateful to this day that a woman of that prestige and authority would actually write me back. And for those that haven't read the book, I wrote her out of the blue because her book, The Road from Corain, was so beloved by my girlfriends in rural Australia and I when I was a sheep farmer's wife. And she grew up not very far from our farm. And so out of the blue, she published this book about her own childhood and her struggles as trying to get to become an academic and in a world of men over in Australia. And it just so resonated with me. And when I did write her, as you know, Tom, because you read the book, she wrote me back and just said, here's the name of my divorce lawyer in Amherst, go and see him basically and get a divorce. I still have that letter. I have it framed in my office. I'm just overcome that she was so absolutely brutally honest and so kind to do that. So yes, and I think to myself, you know, someday someone, you know, I mean, if you're a woman in a leadership role and some little tiny person writes you, I think it's really important to write them back. Okay, that was it, it is a, a very interesting story that she would take that time. Yeah, to do so, that. so thoughtful. But she was also very familiar with the culture of Australia and uh, advised you accordingly. Uh, if, uh, if you reflect again back, you obviously had strength and fortitude to undertake. Uh, often very solo adventures. Uh, you developed a sense of confidence. How do you, how do you if, if a young woman or even a man for that, uh, for that matter, came to you and said, uh, how would you advise me? What, what do I need to do to develop the strength and confidence that you've exhibited through these uh, various uh, efforts to visit all seven continents and different cultures where were languages, I'm sure some challenges in itself. But what, what kind of advice would you give a young person? Uh, because before you could do your, your research, before you could develop the, uh, the sort of niche in, in the biological world that you have, you had to have a kind of confidence and strength that uh, enabled you to do that. What what kind of advice would you give someone who was had dreams and uh, passions, but didn't know whether they could bring it off? Looking back, I think I wished I'd been bolder and stronger and smarter, and I don't think I was. I might have shortcut my career and maybe more quickly accomplished more things. But having been who I was, and at the time, I do obviously advise a lot of women and men students, and I'm really excited for them. And my advice usually is, you know, number one, say yes. And number two is, we can solve just about anything. I love helping people solve challenges and we can invent tools or we can figure out ways to get something done or we can find a scholarship or funding. So I do think that um, 
keeping some hope for students is really important and walking them through solutions. And so I do advise, of course, a proportion, a large proportion of women. And I tell them two things, be bold and smarter than I was. And number two, women need to support other women. I still think we're in a world where sometimes it's harder to do. You can't go play golf on the weekend and you can't go to the bar after work because you go home and help your kids with their homework and buy the groceries or whatever it is. I think, you know, a woman's role is still defined in many communities and certainly in many cultures. So for women to be supportive of other women, I think is still a critical part of their success. I know we're getting close to question time, but uh, your last chapter uh, in this of your books, uh, as well as in some of the earlier ones, is sort of a cry de quoi, uh, a cry of the heart. Uh, it sort of distills uh, all of your learnings, all of your interests, all of your passions uh, about about the future. Do you want to just sort of sort of summarize or at least uh, give a, an explanation of what what was behind that? Sure. And again, I'm going to give a big shout out to some of my Williams classmates. The class of 76 had a special trip to the Amazon three years ago. And that project that I describe in the last chapter came from the hearts and souls of a lot of my classmates, both those who went on the trip and didn't. And in essence, for those of you who don't have the book, it's a new project called Mission Green. Uh, my friend Sylvia Earle, who's an oceanographer, has a program called Mission Blue, where she identifies hope spots, she calls them, in the ocean, areas worthy of saving. And now I have a new project called Mission Green, where we've identified the 10 most endangered forest types in the world. And we're trying to create essentially genetic libraries. We know we can't go in and save the entire Amazon, but we can find the highest biodiversity forest plot and say, let's absolutely save this. And how do we do that? We can build a canopy walkway, just like Hopkins Forest, uh, and we can hire local indigenous people to be the guides. And once they get a sustainable income, they're very, very passionate to save the trees. They understand that trees equals money if the trees are alive, and it's more money than if the trees are dead and sold as logs. So that project, we hope, will build these 10 walkways in the next 10 years, and uh, we're raising a million dollars for each site, starting with Madagascar next year, which only has 3% of its forests left, so it's tragic. But each forest place has very tried and true local partnerships. None of this can happen without many, many years of either my on the ground work with locals or one of my colleagues that we've solicited for this project. Because guess what, we can't wait. You know, we can probably renovate artworks in a couple decades time, but we can't reverse deforestation if it hits in Madagascar and the Amazon and India or Mozambique loses all of its trees and biodiversity, nothing can bring that back. So that's my sort of message of hope that hopefully we can develop a project that's very Williams-based in this case to turn a few things around that might make a difference for our children. All right. Uh, one of the questions that I know I'm sure you get from especially younger folks is, uh, sort of the experience of, of, of climbing and, and what you've encountered in that climbing and sort of the question like what's your favorite uh, critter to find up in the a tree and what's your least favorite critter to find up in the tree? Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you sort of encourage people without discouraging them by sort of focusing on any kind of uh, risks or threats? That's right. You know, about a couple hours ago, I spoke to 200 fifth graders in rural Tennessee and faces of all colors. And these kids are like, oh, what have you been bitten? What's the scariest animal? It is so much fun to hear what kids say. But I usually tell them two things. I say I, I get more mosquito bites in Florida and Minnesota than I ever do in the Amazon. And number two, my scariest moment is crossing the street in New York City during rush hour. It's not being in the jungle. So 
I feel that it's probably a bit of Hollywood hype, but it's mostly a safe environment. And certainly there are creatures to be mindful of in any ecosystem we go to. But I think most of them are know that we're coming long before we get there. And if nothing else, there's so much to see. You get an incredible sense of wonder to see critters in the jungle. And it's a fabulous experience especially to share with your grandchildren for some of the folks that are my alumni age. Talk about your, the role that your boys have played, both uh, as, your, as your role as the mother, but also as they become, in effect, colleagues through time. Yeah, Talk that was unusual. <laughs> and, you know, I, as the book kind of explains, I became a single mom because we took a little bit of exit from the sheep farm and the rural outback life, thanks to Jill Conway in many cases. Um, it was pretty obvious the boys were growing up with a lot of bias to the role of gender, and that really worried me. So as a single mom, they did come with me a lot because if I had left them home alone, I guess I would have gotten arrested, right? So they learned to climb pretty young. I got special harnesses made for them at age six, and uh, they were the best finders. Kids can find the bugs on the leaves much better than adults, and they, you know, for the most part, found that pretty adventurous and fun. So they did become a really great uh, set of assistants for me. We had a lot of fun when I was a visiting professor at Hopkins Forest, going out with some of my students and even assisting them at the time. It was fabulous. And they both pursued science degrees and they're doing work in some elements of science or environment, I would say. One is doing clean energy and the other is doing poop. Um, he has a company that's curing disease through the microbiome element of research, which is pretty exciting. So I just have to laugh that uh, maybe counting bugs in their youth was not such a bad thing. So uh, as you reach this point, uh, what's next? Mission Green, save these 10 forests, work with some of my Williams College colleagues, work with donors, work with local indigenous people, get this job done, and then I can go into the grave and understand earthworms a little better. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe write a few children's books. I'm excited to continue to communicate to the youth. I think that's really important for our future. One of the things I did admire in the book is your focus on, on people with disabilities and oh, getting, right. getting them in nature. And uh, uh, sometime I'll tell you about a, a, an activity that I was involved with at International Paper to create a, a, a wilderness experience for people with disabilities in the Adirondacks, but that's for another time. Fantastic. Well, let's go visit a walkway someday. You have the Adirondacks up near you. We just built a new one in Quichy, Vermont. So. Maybe there's a lot, an outing in store, Tom. All right. I see Lila has come back on the screen. So thank you so much. Monitoring the questions. Thank you so much, you too. I think we've all learned so much. And actually, um, Meg, we have a question from Audrey Sheffield, who's asking something um, quite related uh, to what we were just discussing. Can you recommend any per, uh, particular organizations that are effectively connecting young people to nature and the environment? Wow, that's a great question, because that issue is really local in so many cases. There is a wonderful friend of mine named Richard Liu, who wrote a book called Last Child in the Woods, and he has a uh, term called nature deficit disorder, but he has a group, quite an extensive national group. If you Googled Rich Louvre or um, Last Child in the Woods, you would come up with a lot of different local organizations that they use to get kids into nature. I also do a lot of advising to homeschooling groups, which do a lot of outdoor activities. Um, so sometimes it's grassroots and not necessarily something that's so official. I've also seen that Audubon has junior programs. A lot of conservation foundations now have junior programs. So I would definitely pursue that. Even my tree foundation, we try to bring get kids to come on our expeditions to the Amazon or wherever we're counting insects or trying to work with local people to learn about the uses of the trees for medicines and things like that. So don't ever, you know, turn over every stone because it's out there. Love that so much. Yes, and it's so important to get them connected young children. So that's terrific.
Um, we have a question from Michelle Gleason Gonzalez, who is actually class of nine, uh, 96, a biology and pre-med. Um, she says she hasn't finished the Arbor Knot yet, but loves it so far um, and is really intrigued by the myriad discoveries that have been made in the canopy, um, but also notes there's a great deal more going on underground than we ever realized. Um, and so Michelle's asking, have you had an opportunity to collaborate with scientists studying the underground fungal network, the wood wide web to see how it relates to what's going on in the canopy? Yes, I actually worked on that myself in the 1980s. So I was one of the first wood wide web workers. <laughs> if I can say all that, those W's. And I worked with a really famous colleague from Santa Barbara, California named Joe Connell who founded some important theories about diversity. And we found some amazing things at the time. And I kind of was at a crossroads, ground canopy. And um, the bottom line was more people can access the ground more easily than the canopy. So I, I guess I picked the road less traveled, but it is a very interesting and you know connected piece of the whole forest tapestry. Um, probably the, macroorganisms are less diverse at the ground. Certainly the micro critters are hugely diverse, but the majority of insects and birds and animals still live at the top, which is definitely gonna keep me busy. So I've just decided to stay at the top now that I'm up there. <laughs> but thanks for asking that. It's a pretty cool thing. And you know, the first work on communication of trees was actually leaves giving chemicals out. That was at the Hubbard Brook Forest in New Hampshire. And now we know that trees communicate through their roots, but we also learned in the 80s and 90s that they communicate by sending out volatile oils through their leaves. So trees are amazing, all parts of trees, top to bottom. So amazing. Um, so Stephen Carter Lovejoy is asking, um, Stephen says, I'm fascinated with your work with church forests in Ethiopia. Is there any attempt to try to link some of these isolated wood lots into a broader forest? Yep, that's a great question. And every conservation biology conference where I speak asks me that question. And the answer is not right now, no. And the reason is because Ethiopia doesn't have very advanced agriculture, no metal tools, no tractors, no irrigation. So the farmers need to plow every single acre of what they have and the business of returning the forest isn't there yet until we get some Western technology into rural Ethiopia, which has been very slow compared to other countries that people can't really afford to turn the land back to forests. So right now my priority is saving those genetic libraries. So then when the day comes that they do get the benefit of some funding and global interest in bringing better farming techniques to them, they can immediately start returning some of the area to forest. And they understand that they're very, very devoted to saving these last patches of forest but it is a really scary situation. Again, they have 3% of their forest left in Northern Ethiopia. Um, and so it's very touch and go because will those tiny patches survive? Will the organisms become extinct before we can start to connect those corridors? And um, it just requires funding to make sure we can set these properties aside with gates and moving stones to build walls. It's pretty simple, but it's also more money than any of those local people have. So we're just hoping, hoping we can turn that around in the next few years. Thank you for that. Um, Meg, I know uh, earlier in the conversation, you and Tom were talking about, you know, the dangers and the, the engineering required to actually do this. Um, Marty Wasserman um, is asking, what's the, the most dangerous situation that you've faced as a result of this, you know, professional curiosity in climbing the, the leaves and the canopies? Um, the most scary moment I ever had was encountering poachers. So that's not what you expected me to say, I know, but you know, these people that were driven to steal the timber out of the forest, they are, you know, they have guns and they have chainsaws and you just don't really want to mess with them. So that's was my biggest fear. And actually in Australia, 
there was a lot of that going on. People are always surprised to think in such a developed country that was such a big problem, but it was huge. Uh, so that would be the biggest danger. In my canopy experience, believe it or not, we've only ever lost one canopy walkway out of about 40 or 50 that I've been part of. And that was due to Hurricane Mitch blasting into the coastline of Belize and taking out the whole forest, including the walkway. Um, so that's not surprising, but for the most part, uh, they're really simple structures. They don't get a huge lot of pressure because you never have a thousand people jumping on them at once. And so they've been very resilient and that's been wonderful. Falling out of a tree can be an issue. Um, I've been super, super conservative, as I mentioned, always climbing on pretty big branches to support me. I've had maybe one or two colleagues have climbing accidents, which is probably a lot less than bicycling. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, I actually want to share something from the chat, which is from Rebecca Beavers. Um, and she's, she's thanking you, Meg, for being a mentor to so many. She's class of 93, bio and ecology. And she shares that after a lecture that you gave at Williams, she asked you about a unique uh, about unique environmental careers. And you said uh, to get a PhD and find a way to apply that expertise. And Rebecca's sharing, she's now the first coastal geology and uh, adaptation to climate change coordinator for the National Park Service for 21 years, uh, oh, which is amazing. Uh, and I, you know, there are a couple of questions here about um, relating to this culture of, um, you know, in order to, to thrive and survive as a female scientist, you know, um, uh, there's there's um, a question here about Lab Girl by Hope uh, Jaren and uh, you know a question about uh, Jane Goodall calling out the Arbornaut as one of the best books that she's read lately. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Um, I guess culture is there sort of a, a code of conduct to be a female scientist and and what that's like. Uh, I think, I hope it's gaining. I think there needs to be in some ways, and I've been so grateful that Jane has embraced a lot of my work, mainly because she figured out later in her career that trees actually keep her primates alive. You know, it's been one of those wonderful things to watch as she's become more plant oriented. And she did a lovely cover review um, of my book. And yeah, I was thrilled she wrote that. The New York Times didn't review it, but at least Jane did. So if anybody has a connection with the New York Times, I would beg of you, why not trees? <laughs> um, and uh, Hope, of course, left the country and went off to Norway with a tenured professorship for life, so we might never see her again. <laughs> but um, anyway, she that was a wonderful book, and it certainly was helpful to me to read her book about life in the lab, so many different different issues. In fact, I joke about that in my world where at least I know Hope could order a pizza in or she could get a Coke at night, whereas when you're in the jungle, you better have it with you or else you'll starve. So quite different kinds of situations. But hopefully and increasingly there are women in science groups and there you know, still need to be mentoring for men and women together. But I think it's probably something that's happening. I've been part of an ecological network called SEEDS where we mentor all kinds of diversity. And that's where my project with Mobility Limited Kids kind of was inspired. But there's certainly plenty of minority students in so many different ways that need mentoring and not just females. And we need all the brain cells we can at the conservation table right now because it's quite urgent in the planet. Uh, Meg, such a poignant note to end on, and we, I don't know how, but we've reached the end of our hour together. So thank you so much to Meg and to Tom for facilitating this conversation. Um, we really appreciate the time that you've taken to share your insights and perspectives with the EAF community. Um, and thank you to all of our audience members that tuned in. Uh, just a reminder that we're going to continue to have these really meaningful conversations, workshops, and programs um, well beyond the bicentennial of the Society of Alumni, and we really hope that you'll engage as you're able. Um, so with that, thank you for joining us and take good care, everyone. Thank you again. Happy holiday. Thanks, Layla. Bye. Thanks, Tom. Yep.